there, it's State Representative Gloria Johnson here with Dave Gorman and we're going to talk about vouchers with you guys this morning. Let's see, uh, trying to make sure this is the right quote uh, channel to do it on. So I'm not seeing anything here. Let us know if you can see this on the event page. Maybe I didn't switch it over. Okay, we are not seeing this anywhere. Oh, there we are. Okay, great. We'll just do it right here. There you go. All right. It's first, my first time uh, doing this this way, so uh, bear with us. Bear with us. But we want to answer your questions about vouchers. We want to know what you're thinking. We're going to tell you a little bit about we know. You can uh, what we know. You can put your questions in the comment section, um, or just follow along and and find out what's happening with vouchers. Uh, one of my big frustrations with this bill is it seems like one of those situations where they're building the airplane while they're flying it, because um, it didn't seem like a really uh, well laid out plan. Typically, when you bring big, uh, changing, widespread change legislation, you have a plan, you map it out, you know how it's going to affect everybody, you know, at every county level and other schools and all of that. We just haven't seen that. What we've seen is a quickly slammed together bill because we were told at the beginning of session, oh, we're not going to do vouchers this year. We're going to wait on that. Um, and what we found out is they absolutely were, but they were going to slap together a plan that is literally shape-shifted every time it's gone to a different body to vote on. Why, why, why are they doing that? Why is it changing every time? The reason the, the bill changes every time is there are certain votes on that committee that they're trying to get. They don't have the votes they need, so what they do is um, think about who's on this particular committee the bill is going before and how can we get all of their votes? And so, you know, when you've got to change a bill every time it moves, you've got a problem. Well, the problem is all they say about, you know, trying to do this for the children, and clearly it's not for the children and hasn't been. It's, it's about political favors and payback and, and all the intrigue and disgusting things that, that make people hold their nose when it comes to politics. Right. Well, exactly. If you read Frank Cagle's article, he actually hit really closely to what's happening with this bill. I've talked to uh, multiple legislators on both sides of the aisle who have gotten called to the governor's office and had their arms twisted um, uh, and uh, called to the speaker's office to also get more arm twisting. It's like being called to the principal's office. <laughs> it, it is every time. It's, it, and, and what happens when they get called in? Well, they tell them, if you support my bill, we'll be in your town campaigning for you. If you don't support my bill, we're running ads against you, and we will primary you. We've already seen the ads. Yeah, who, the are, the, big, who are the groups putting the those big, ads on? The big dark money groups like American Federation for Children, Betsy DeVos's group has a little subsidiary here called Tennessee Federation for Children. Um, she has, they have put millions into money here in Tennessee for years trying to get vouchers and to elect officials who will support vouchers. And so you would see as literally the weekend after the vote, the week before, you saw at negative ads run on those guys who voted no on vouchers. You saw positive ads on those who changed their vote to vote for the vouchers. A couple of those people, uh, the governor actually showed up in their town that weekend to, to talk with them and to promote them. Not just the speaker, the governor. The governor is wow. actually doing it. Yeah, and these calls are, are being made and people are asked, being asked to come to the governor's office. Some to the speaker's office one day after a voucher vote, um, or right before the voucher vote in full ed in the House, the a Tennessean reporter stood outside of Glenn Cassida's office watching as each the member parade. was called in. Well, it's, it's, these are freshman members a lot of times, so this is their yeah. first time going through this, and you know they're being 
educated <laughs> to yeah. toe the line and, and vote the, the, you know, what they say is the right way. Yeah. And, it, and, you know, it's kind of like, oh, we've got a new governor, help the governor. Well, I don't think our governor needs that kind of help. Our kids need help. And, and our kids need to have their schools fully funded. This is going to be $130 million taken out of our public schools. How do we survive that? I mean, uh, you what, know, what is that? Uh, we're already way behind on BEP funding. We're scratching uh, the ground, the dirt, trying to find more money. Uh, we're you know, doing all kinds of things with less money. The, the bang for the buck that we get uh, compared to other states that fund higher, you know, I mean, we're working as hard as we can. Yeah. Uh, with with a lot less than that we're supposed to have. And now they're talking about taking away more money. We know what that's going to look like. Exactly. And it's definitely not about the kids. Right, right. And, and I was just talking with Dave before. We've got a fact sheet that says how much each county will um, have to increase property taxes if 10% of the kids in their county were on vouchers. So what we've got right now is if 10% um, if of Knox County kids are on vouchers, we're gonna have to raise property taxes by 34%. No, nobody's even said that in Knox County. Yeah, nobody's you, you, you won't hear people 34%. talking about that, but if 10% of the kids get vouchers, we've got to raise property taxes 34%. And, and that's on us. That's not that's not state money. That's what we have to do to, to fill that deficit that's going right. to be created. And, and you'll see a lot of that. What you'll see a lot of situations where the county is going to have to be coming up with this money because the state's going to no longer be providing it. Well, aren't they now talking about relieving Knox County from this legislation for a period of time? Aren't they looking to <laughs> to, to streamline it somehow to to shove it through? Right. So, so again, it's going to go, the body it's currently going to go before, what they've done is they've taken out some of the counties, and <laughs> it's looking like maybe it'll, maybe it'll be only Nashville and Shelby. Um, and that's not acceptable, because for me, it's not good for Knox County. Why would I think it's good for Shelby or for uh, Davidson County? Well, we would have to ask Bill Dunn that, wouldn't we? Yeah. Since he's yeah. been the, the driving force behind this for years, he's failed for years. Uh, and, you know, now Knox County might be exempt for a period of time. It's obviously not going to go away forever. Right. If they get it done this year, then maybe we'll see it next year. That's yeah. The, that's the payoff and now to... We've got we've got one question is where is that info? Um from Nathan Higdon. And Nathan, I will you, Nathan. get that for you. I have got it on um, an information sheet that I got um, in at, in the legislature. So I can get that to you. And I know that you're in Blount County and I'm not sure what the increase would be in Blount County, but I'll, I'll get that information for you. And it, and it goes specifically to how, it tells you how they came up for, with the information. All of the facts that I have this are cited and the background is done on where they came from. So um, I can I can get that to you and I will actually put it on my Facebook page when I get that sheet. I think I left it in Nashville um, because I was working on how do I get this 15 pages of information onto a social media site so that people could see it. Um, it's, it's, but it's really important information. Absolutely. And, um, and someone is asking, is it true that students who um, take don't have to take all of the tests. Absolutely. Right now, um, it's gone back and forth. At first, they were going to take all the tests. Then they were only going to take the math and and math and reading portion, not the science and social studies portion. Um, that was changed to um, they're not going to take any of those accountability measures. So we're talking about private schools that don't have to hire certified teachers that are under none of the transparency and accountability rules that public schools are under. That's why they're private schools. They want to, to do, the, do it separately. And that is why only private funds can pay for that schooling. I have no problem with private schools whatsoever. The problem I have are with public tax dollars going to a private school 
that doesn't share any of the accountability measures or the transparency measures that public schools are under. Well, and you didn't even mention SPED. Yes. Uh, you know, parents who are looking for help, looking for options for their kids, uh, may not realize that public uh, private schools don't have those same responsibilities. And in fact, uh, you're essentially signing away your rights to, to those kids getting the support that they need. And right. once you do that, there's no obligation for anybody to provide that for you. It's it's. Uh, it, I've it, never seen a public a private school that offered uh, occupational therapy, physical therapy, speech. You know, I've seen them some that offer a few services for LD kids, maybe something like that. But the range of services that you can get for a special needs child, a special education child, in the county will never be matched yeah. by a private school, and. So that's why the National Council for Exceptional Children is uh, definitely opposed to vouchers because it's terrible for special ed kids. And I think the other point about special ed I like to make, and it's not just special ed kids, but maybe kids who have had some problems in high school or you know in their local school. Um, we talk about school choice a lot. You'll hear uh, Bill Dunn and some other representatives talk about, well, parents need a choice. With this bill, parents do not get a choice. The private school gets to choose right. which kids they will take. The choice, we are giving choice to the private school with public tax dollars. And so the private school can say, no, we're not taking that child. No, we're not taking, you know, severely, um, multiply handicapped kids. They're too expensive. And we're not taking these kids. Um, and I don't think we should be using public tax dollars for schools that won't take all of our kids. Public schools teach every child. And because of that, what we're going to see are the kids with um, more severe needs and less support in the public schools and the kids in private schools will be those that don't need much help. And then you say, compete, compete. <laughs> How do you compete with millions fewer dollars and the kids with the um, most important or the most severe needs? It doesn't make sense. I want to speak to that whole business model as well. Um, I know that Representative Don also likes to talk about that a lot. He, well, schools need to be competitive. Schools can't be competitive if they're not getting the same amount of money because these private schools, that $7,500 voucher, is not going to pay for most of the private schools in, in Knox County that parents want to go to. And so it's not going to be for those uh, poor kids because they're not going to be able to come up with the extra money. It's going to be those of means who are going to be able to use those vouchers and come up with that extra sure. money. And so this is why it's absolutely not a choice. It is completely out of the hands of so many of our students in Knox County and so many of the million students in Tennessee. And if the rural counties don't think just because they're cut out of this that it's not going to affect them, they are not it paying attention. Will. And can you tell well, them a little bit about that, Dave? Well, you know, I, I, I was sitting here thinking about the, uh, the list that grows every day of school boards across the state that are saying, no, we don't want vouchers. And these are not the big city school systems. These are rural school systems saying, we don't want this. We, we are against this. We don't, uh, we don't need this. Nobody's asking us about it. It's amazing to me the momentum that this appears to have uh, that, that doesn't involve educators. It involves, uh, you know, Groups that superintendents associations against it, the school boards are against it, the teachers are against it, the administrators against it. You have totally cut educators out of an education discussion. Uh, well, we've seen that when when uh, Betsy DeVos came to Nashville uh, a couple weeks ago and had that that meeting with uh, with the governor and and other folks. There were no teachers in that in that room. Who was in they, the room? Uh, <laughs> well, lobbyists. That was a, that was a fascinating uh, chart that showed all the interests that were in that room. And if you, if you haven't seen Jennifer Owen's uh, chart that shows all the connections to money and, and education, it's, it's gross. 
Yeah. Uh, but it's also pretty fascinating. And, and if you haven't shared, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping you shared it. Yeah, I shared haven't, it. <laughs> we'll put it back up in this when we're done. But it's uh, it's fascinating and it, it's horrifying to see all the people that are looking to uh, drain the funding out of public education. They're just waiting um, for, for the siphon to open. And, right, uh, yeah. You know, how does that help our kids? They had, but, they had an education discussion with Betsy DeVos, who has decimated education in Michigan, and a bunch of lobbyists that are funding the, uh, that fund the, the myriad of, of lobbyists in Nashville that's, that are there to support charters and vouchers. Right. We've got, um, we've got a teacher asking, let's see, well, Joseph, uh, Joe Malgeri is asking about how, talk more about the 7,500 not covering the cost. So most of the private schools in Webb is more than double what the voucher is going to be. Catholic is more, I think uh, uh, CAK is more than that as well. Most of the more popular private schools in Knoxville, $7,500 does not cover tuition. Uh, then beyond tuition, if you have, you know, they were, they're talking about helping kids who typically are kids with free lunch. How are the kids going to get transportation to the school? They're not going to have free lunch. There are uniform costs. And I know that my friends in private school are always talking about it. It seems like every week they're asking for a check for something. And so I just don't know how we're not creating. We got, or you're creating two tracks within a, within a private school. You got kids who, you know, are they going to be able to bring their lunch? Some days maybe, some days maybe not. Are they going to get a lunch? Are they just going to watch the other kids eat? Um, they're taking different tests than than the other students. It, you know, this is not the answer. Um, and and I, I don't think private schools want that level of of investigation or accountability that would go with taking public money as well. I mean, I, I don't hear... I hear that from a lot of... I don't, I don't hear private schools saying yes, please. I don't, I don't hear the local private schools saying yes, we want this, bring this on. We, we will take these children and we will accommodate them. Yeah, I've actually heard uh, Montessori's uh, school teachers and, and such say, you know, we don't want this. And so it's, um, you know, who wants it? The lobbyists want it and the special interests want it. And... So we've got someone asking about how she's a teacher and she says, how is this going to affect me in the classroom? And, um, and how's this going to affect my classroom? And I think what you're going to see is far fewer dollars uh, in the future as we go and as we expand this program. You'll see far fewer dollars uh, that are coming to, to, the, to the classrooms. Um, okay, so someone is saying, why don't we, this is, sounds like a, a voucher supporter, and he says, why don't we let parents drive kids' educational decisions uh, instead of bureaucrats, and he thanks Governor Lee. Well, parents don't get to drive this at all. Some parents do. Some parents, a large number, a very large number of parents are not going to have this choice. It's only going to be a few parents who are going to have this choice. Those who support vouchers continually act like every parent has a choice. Every parent can't cover the difference. Every parent's child will not be accepted by a private school. So I'm sorry, that is not an argument. We're using public tax dollars that go for the common good. The common good is not a handful of parents getting a choice. I'm sorry, that's not the use for public tax dollars. And if we fully and equitably funded every public school, then that would be unnecessary. Here's the deal. We've heard for, since all this testing stuff started, we've heard schools are failing. I don't ever want it. schools are not failing. We are failing communities and we're failing our kids by not fully funding those schools. We know that graduation rates have never been higher in the, in the country and in the state. Over the years, graduation rates have never been higher. ACT scores 
have never been higher. We have never had so many kids going to college, and that's kids of color, and that's women. We have never seen the numbers in the country and in the state like we're seeing now. Here's what's failing. We are failing our struggling communities. Where we see kids not doing well are kids that lack support and they lack a support system. So what we need to do is invest in communities. We need to do things like provide, making sure everyone has access to health care, uh, making sure that we raise the wage, and make sure that those schools in struggling communities have extra staff, they have extra social workers and guidance counselors, and that they have a smaller uh, student to teacher ratio, fewer kids in the classroom. That's more, how more we nurses. make a difference, more nurses. We definitely have a problem and a shortage of nurses in our schools. And so if you truly want to address the needs of that kid in a struggling community, you don't pick him up out of that community and drop him off somewhere else. You fix what's wrong in that community and you fix that school and that requires funding. And instead of fixing that neighborhood school, we're sending that kid across town if he can get there. And so we come back to a great answer here is community schools where we take the school that's in the community, open it up from three to seven in the evening, provide tutoring and mentoring, job and training, job training for parents, healthcare, and, uh, dentist, and a couple of our schools have got huge, just massive uh, gardens where parents are taking home vegetables on the weekend and in food deserts. And at uh, Pond Gap, they started cooking classes. Like a lot of the things that they're growing, people don't necessarily know how to cook. So mm -hmm. they're doing cooking classes for yeah, folks to, to learn tutoring, how to do that. Language tutoring and, and all kinds of social uh, programming things that are helping to bring that community together, make it stronger so that people know each other in the community, the school is the center of it. All those things that when people hearken back to a time, you know, it makes them feel good about what the school was. And when we, right. when we look at how we really, really uh, put schools at the end of a very long vine and they're expected to get all their nutrients from that very long vine, now we're talking about cutting, up, cutting them off even more. It's, it's outrageous. Yeah, yeah. I think that um, it's, it's really an important point to make that the, the whole community is important. And when we break up these communities, send them to private schools and charter schools, we're not addressing the needs of the community. Let's make the school the hub of that community like it has been. It's not really, like Dave's talking about, it's not really a new idea. It's actually a very old idea. But it worked when that school was the hub of the community. People knew they could go there. Um, it's when you see a, a really good community school in action, and we have got so many of them, both through UT and the Great Schools Partnership, um, it just, it's just, <coughs> you don't want to leave. When you, when I go in the afternoon and when I go visit, I don't want to leave. It's such a great experience. And so we're going to cut the money to do things like that, that keep kids in their community and improve their whole community. And, and then lessen the accountability that goes with that funding to a, to a school that may not even want to be open to that type of scrutiny. Uh, they're not given the same tests. All of the things that, all the measuring sticks that public schools are expected to live up to, yeah, don't apply right. to private schools. And how how can how can that be considered that they're good stewards of of, of that funding? Right. And Lauren Sorensen made the point and was quoted this week by the great Diane Ravitch that uh, you know the the legislators are under. Uh, the responsibility of funding public schools, not private schools, and yet here we are. Well, we've got a question too uh, from uh, Linda, and she, I think she's from more middle rural Tennessee. Okay. And so her question is, talk about how this legislation impacts rural schools where there is no private school choice. Well, currently the rural schools are cut out of the legislation. That's a cut they made because guess what? Rural legislators do not support this legislation. A few of them, like Matthew Hill, Timothy Hill, and Micah Van Huss, have made a turnaround because they did a rural kickback that gives rural counties $68,000.
Folks, $68,000 is barely one teacher's salary and benefits. And they're selling out their vote for that. They're selling out their vote for for nothing. And, and, and selling out is legit because Matthew Hill was on record in his campaign as saying he was anti-vouchers. That right, that's correct. And now he has gone ahead and indicated that he is for vouchers. Uh, many people who campaigned on being against vouchers, including Brian Kelsey in Memphis, uh, Matthew Hill, I would imagine Timothy Hill as well, and Micah Van Huss, um, we're, we're losing them because they got their arm twisted and they got a little money back to their county. But I'm talking well, about a little money. Well, you've got, but you have some legislators that are showing bravery who are doing the right thing, yes. who are sticking to their guns. And in the case of uh, Garden Hire down in Chattanooga, he's actually uh, turned against this and, and uh, complained that nobody came to talk to him about uh, education issues in, in Hamilton County. Well, they've cut out Hamilton County. Let's see if he stays there. Right. They're cutting out counties on That's purpose. That's why they did that. Right. Of course. Because they're trying to change the bill. But also, to back to the rural schools, you know, this $130 million that's coming out of the school budget is going to affect rural counties. Rural counties don't have the benefit, in a lot of them, of ha even having a private school. Um, but they're going to see less dollars flowing to their county. And that's just the reality all around. It's gonna be split statewide, even if only, you know, a couple of counties have these. And understand that the first year, they might um, keep it to Davidson and Shelby. But next year, I promise you, they'll be back. Every single state that has done vouchers has done some little bit, and the next year it got bigger and bigger. And I was talking to Dave before this, also in my data, you have got a 1,800% increase on money spent in vouchers in the states that have done them for a couple of years. Anywhere from 1,300 to 1,800% increase of money spent. And again, it goes back to if 10% of the kids in Knox County get vouchers, property taxes will be increased by 34 percent. That money has to come from somewhere. Absolutely. Wow. Absolutely. Let's see if we have other questions. Um, lots of thank yous. You know, we had one person who supported vouchers on this and all the other comments, questions are against vouchers. And that, that was something that a, a friend of ours said that he wanted to see addressed he has a friend in, in Fountain City area whose child went to um, a community school, loved, loved the community school. And the fact that his kid could stay after for a while enabled him to work extra hours and get some extra time in so they could, you know, increase, make their family budget better and, and give him actually more quality time with the child too because um, he was able to work those hours when the child was there and, and be with the child at home. And the child is moving up to the next school. Um, I don't know if it was elementary to middle or, or middle. To, probably was elementary to middle is my guess because most of our community schools are at that elementary level. But he was, he was really concerned that his middle school was not going to be a community school because it was such a great um, thing for his child. And, you know, he's like, how come we don't have more community schools? Well, the problem is we're not, we're not funding that. that. A lot of that comes from private money and, and things like that. So if we weren't doing vouchers, we could be investing that in community schools and more community schools that really help parents and help parents, you know, improve the family budget and do better. And, you know, when families aren't struggling so much and families are doing better, those kids do so much better in school. I know, Dave, you've probably seen this, but I saw it so much because most of my 27 years were in struggling schools. Mm -hmm. And when when a family is struggling, that kid feels it. Oh, and, absolutely. And it's, it, 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 it affects their school, school day. And, and you know, you, you hope that all they have to worry about is school, but you know better, you can tell. and. You know, they linger around um, after class a little bit, and they're, you know, sometimes looking up to you. You can tell that they they just need a kind word, or they need to, to share something with you, or 
you know, they, they need a, a snack bar or something like that. You know, right, I can't right. tell you the number of teachers I know that keep some some energy bars or, or some some snacks available for these kids who are coming looking for something more than just what they're getting out of their books and, and you know that they're um, that, that school means everything for them. Right, right. So we've got a lot coming in right now. Um, Paul is asking, can we get a copy of the information sheet? Yes, I'm going to get that. I was trying to figure out how to get all that. I think I'll, what I'll do is just scan every page of that and then post it online. And I'll do that on both my representative page and my personal Facebook page so people will have that information. Joe is asking um, about the if, the, if a school system like Jefferson County has a thousand students, they're talking about a buck a kid to sell out for that 68,000, you know, I mean, um, and he, then he asked where Faison and Farmer are on this. And, uh, I can't tell you specifically for, for those two. Um, I would think maybe I, I I'm not positive, so I don't want to say, I would think, I think maybe Representative Faison might homeschool his kids, but I'm not sure about that. So I, I, I don't want to say where those two are, Joe. Sorry. I don't know specifically where they are. But of course, you know, contacting them through email and phone calls uh, is, is crucial right now. And we see that a lot of people are uh, making their position clear in their responses. So uh, email them and, and ask and uh, keep emailing. They need to hear from you. They, uh, uh, they, they sometimes say they just don't uh, hear from people or that they, they've gotten all the information that they need. My uh, gosh, Representative Dunn claims that he has surveyed the people in his <laughs> community and they clearly are in favor of school choice and he believes that uh, with, with the governor in office that was a mandate to, to uh, live up to uh, what Governor Lee wants to do. Um, people in, in Lee's district that I talked to say they, excuse me, in Dunn's district that I've talked to have said they haven't heard about any survey. They've never been surveyed. Um, we have some interesting things developing politically perhaps in that district and, and maybe a challenger that, that, uh, will step up. We certainly hope so because, uh, I don't think he speaks for the people in his district, no matter what he says. He, he doesn't, he doesn't share, uh, well, well his, the the thing that the thing that a lot of these legislators do, they call us. They they send a, a what is that survey monkey? They send a survey monkey thing to their email list. Well, they only I can have tell an email. you, they only I can have tell you, for people that my support. email list is. I mean, people can sign up on my state legislature web page, but I know almost every single person on my email list. So I know that they think like me. I would never consider a survey from my email list to be an accurate survey because those are the people that I, I, I want. They keep up with you. They I want you my there. email list yeah. to be people who don't know me, you know, who just really care about. And I hope that I can grow that. But the reality is those ones that really pay attention to those emails are people who a lot of times are your supporters. So. That's not, if you want to, if you really want to find out how your district is, you're going to have to do uh, a, a fair and accurate poll. And I don't know if anyone's done that in their district. You know, I have, uh, and, and when running, and, and it doesn't poll well at all. The majority, and, and it depends on how you present it. If you say, would you like school choice for your child? Well, who's going to say no to that? You know, people... well, it sounds so innocuous. And in fact, yeah. when we visited Representative Dunn in his office a few weeks ago during TEA civication, uh, we were talking with him about how there are different uh, routes for children to go in Knox County's public schools with the, with uh, career magnet or STEM and things like that. And then a few hours later, on the floor, he said, "Oh, well, these uh, are in committee." Uh, these teachers from Knox County were talking about how important choice is. And, you know, that's not at all what we said. And, and the way that he used it and twisted it, it was, uh, it was pretty horrible. Well, I mean, and the reality is choice is something that Knox County does offer a lot of. And, and well, they co opt that word and use it and twist <laughs> right. it. Right. You can go to a magnet school. You can transfer out to another school as IB. long as there's an availability. Yeah. Sure. And, and the, and the, and we're going to have less and less choice if they do vouchers and there's less and less money. 
So the reality is, you know, we have got to keep that keep those dollars in um, in our in our public schools. Well, and I, I know public school teachers are working hard on this, and it's great to have superintendents and school boards that are saying this is not what we need. Uh, we also have a lot of community groups uh, across the state that are active in the fight against vouchers. Uh, Pastors for Tennessee Children is a new group this year. Yes. Uh, that's a branch of the Pastors for Texas Children that's been uh, pretty uh, virulently anti-voucher, really, really helping with that. Uh, locally, we've got Jobs of Justice, and SOCOM, and you know, and Campus Workers, all these groups that are coming together and on this issue and support. And it's really helpful, those emails and calls to Nashville from lots of different people really help because we do get dismissed from uh, folks in Nashville, even folks locally, yeah, as yeah. teachers who have an axe to grind or union thugs and, and just silliness like that, that as if our voice doesn't count. When we're the ones in the classrooms, we're the ones who know what this is going to do and, and how this is going to impact our kids. Yeah, it, it, exactly. It's, there, you know, this is such a, there's so much involved here, and I'm just trying to think that it, it, what we've covered, have we covered it all? And I saw that someone said um, that they thought that Farmer was a public ed guy. And that would have been my thought, too. Um, I, but, again, even some of the guys that have typically been anti-voucher, there's a big bunch of arm twisting and a, oh, come on, you know, you've got to support the governor's agenda. He's a new governor, that sort of thing. So they're playing, they're twisting arms. They're also playing on your sympathies a little bit. That these people will use any game to get your vote. and But the game is never about how it helps kids. Because what we found out in every single state that has done vouchers, the vouchers kids do no better than the public school kids. No better. And, and so we're talking about changing how we do education in this state. And there's no research that shows that this is successful. What Florida now says, Florida used to say, you want your kid to do better, you know, use a voucher, go to this other school. Florida now just knows that the, the, the selling point for vouchers now is the parents like it better. Well, but the kids, <laughs> the children are doing no better. Yeah, well, they like it better because they can spend that money in ways that uh, are mind-boggling. Didn't you say you had some information about uh, what voucher money has been spent on in different places oh, in Mexico. Did, did we not talk about, yeah, voucher money. These are, this is a list of things voucher monies have been spent on. Mercedes-Benz payments. Uh, in Chandler, Arizona, a woman was indicted for using her son's ESA money to get an abortion. Um, they've used it for makeup, for comedy tickets, for um, gift cards, I, I read uh, about a sock the, monkey. The Disney membership or the, the season pass at Disney for a family that homeschooled and was able to, to try to justify that as an educational expense. And yep. you know, the, the state says, oh, well, well, we'll have people who will be making sure that these things are spent fairly and, and according to the, you know, that's a whole level of bureaucracy that they have to add just to monitor. Right. Have we figured into into the fiscal note of this bill how many people we're going to have to have policing this when we get up to 30,000 vouchers? I mean, how are we going to police how this money's been spent? We've got a question from uh, Jane. She's actually asking for a friend. Uh, she says that, how can we all get the word out to parents to say no to vouchers? When I'm at social events with parents, I bring up the voucher issue and they have no idea what I'm talking about. Then they get an earful from me. Okay, so kind of, I mean, that's really where we are. Sharing it on social media, sharing the information on social media. One of the best places, I think, to get information is uh, Tennessee Ed Report. It's uh, Andy Spears does this newsletter and it's called Tennessee Ed Report. And it has some of the best, most factual information, especially when it comes to budget, money. You know, Andy is the one who came out with um, really pushing the, the comptroller's report. Our own state comptroller came out with a report saying that we are currently underfunding public education in this state by $500 million. And so here we are underfunding 
and we're getting ready to send $130 million somewhere else. <laughs> So, and, and then in addition to that, this governor gave us less this year, and our mayor is now dealing with a $6 million shortfall, and that's, you know, going to do some serious, they're talking cutting teachers, and they're talking cuts in Knox County schools, and we got less money this year than we got before. At and the I, same time, we're talking about building three brand new schools. Yeah. How would, you know, how do you choose? How do you... Why are we in a position that we have to make right. those tough well, choices when the you know, state is doing this to us? I'm furious because in my district, Lonsdale Elementary has had gas leaks that have sent people to to the doctor and have closed down the school multiple times. Clearly, Lonsdale needs a new school. It needs a whole lot of work. I'm not sure what it needs, but well, we've got kids in a situation where they're in a school that has regular gas leaks. Well, what they do have is passionate parents and great students and fantastic teachers who are working hard every day trying to give those kids the opportunities that they need. And the idea that somehow they're going to get short shrift or, or be losing something because of where they live is is outrageous. Yes. You know? and, and I'm pleased to hear that Knox County Schools and a lot of people are on board trying to make things better. But, you know, you don't improve public schools by taking away public school money. Exactly. Exactly. This isn't hard. Unless you want it to be. And, you know, the motivation behind this type of legislation, this didn't start in Tennessee. It's happening across the country. And the, the groups that are pushing for it all have such a big financial game, uh, gain to be made. And names like, you know, the Federation for Children and, and uh, uh, what, what is the other one? The uh, B Betsy DeVos's. Oh, is, America... American Federation for Children, for children. was okay. the one she was on yeah. the board of. But, you know, I mean, gosh, it, it sure sounds like they're all in it for the kids, but there's... The, yeah. <laughs> they can't even prove that they're in it for the kids. They have no they have no outcomes that show that these kids are being helped. Right. So, and Julie wants to know how much money do Tennessee... Well, Tennessee politicians profit from vouchers. That's an interesting question. We've got the rural kickback that's going to send money to their county, but is she that, makes a really very... a kickback? It's so small. Well, I know it's like, I mean, who buy who sells out for that amount? You know, I mean, I'm not selling out for any amount, but this is such a small amount. I can't believe someone convinced them that that was a good thing to do. But I think, Julie, the interesting thing is the the money that you don't see a lot of times. Those ads that were placed in favor of the ones who flipped their vote and voted for vouchers. Those ads are never going to show up on their disclosure. The way you'd have to find out how much, say, American Federation for Children spent on them is to go to the Tennessee Campaign Finance website and to the Tennessee and look for the Tennessee Federation for Children, and then they'll report how much money they spent on behalf of a candidate, because they can only donate so much to a candidate, but they can send. They can send mail, they can do commercials, they can do digital ads on behalf of that candidate. And it could be up to $100,000. That's, that's one of the ads right there that was run against uh, Mark Cochran. Uh, yeah, Mark Cochran's a freshman who's hanging tough. I think I heard his mom was a teacher. Um, and I hope he hangs with us. I, I think he will. But but they're, they, they'll send those nasty ads on you if you don't do their bidding. And it's really, really frustrating. I mean, they spend hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, these same dark money groups in my 2016 race spent, I'm pretty sure we totaled it up to be about $600,000 to beat me. So they have spent millions, and they spent uh, a, a million in, um, in Nashville. Uh, but they're spending millions every year to beat candidates who are pro-public education. And then they're sending these ads out uh, to punish those who vote what they think is the wrong way. So they've spent millions over the last five or six years in this state. And imagine if all those millions had been spent in our classroom. If American Federation for Children really cared about kids, they'd be putting all that dark money into the classroom. But it's not about the kids. No. 
Let's see, what else have we got on here? I want to cover everything. Yeah, yeah, Joe, you're getting it right. He says, so we cut funding, lose teachers, diminish results, then blame the system to promote the alternatives. That is exactly their plan. That is exactly the plan, and we have known that. We've been fighting that. I think Knox County has done a great job in making people aware and really pushing back. We have one charter school. The other thing is last week out of the House, they passed the charter school authorized and the Senate. It's going to go to the governor's desk. They can, if Knox County says we don't want a particular charter, the state can say, too bad, you've got it. Well, uh, the board that is going to be making those decisions will be appointed by the governor. Yes. And nobody has any belief that he's going to put uh, people who might question the value of charter schools on that committee. Look at who's on the education committee. Well, that are, education are, are you, committee was on, chosen. Are you on the education committee? I am not on the education <laughs> committee. Yeah. However... They've got a freshman on the education committee who is a teacher or former teacher. I don't know if he's still teaching. But um, he has, he passed on one of the voucher votes. And, um, you know, he is, he is selling out. And, and I don't know him at all. We have had, we have not had a conversation. We will hopefully soon before this vote. But I'm just curious, you know, what does he think he's doing? And it's really frustrating, and and I don't. I, I guess they're afraid they won't be back if they don't vote the way the governor wants them to vote, or the way these lobbyists want them to vote. Well, you know, they've got to come back and face their constituents at home, the people that voted them in. And again, as we we're mentioning with uh, uh, Matthew Hill, you know. A lot of these people ran on anti-voucher stances, made those statements. They were in interviews. There's a record. There's video of them saying, I'm against vouchers. And then they go and they vote uh, for this kind of stuff, and they have to come back. And yeah. the people are paying attention now more than ever, it seems. And uh, the idea that the sleeping tiger has been awakened, uh, you know, we need more people paying attention. We need more people active. We need some candidates to run against these people. Uh, this is devastating to our children. In no way is this going to help uh, public education in Tennessee. And again, there's a constitutional requirement that they uh, provide public education for our students, and they're, they're so far away from that with... with uh, yeah, with I think this is, I'm glad you brought up the constitutional uh, commitment. And, and we do have... We have a constitutional um, commitment to uh, make sure every child has a great public school education. And so um, we're not honoring that. There's nothing in the Constitution about private schools. No. Uh, Linda was asking about, yes, they can use it for online education, Linda. They absolutely can. Um, and so we've got that online K-12 Inc. that is really just at the bottom of the barrel every year. And initially when that pa law passed, Harry Brooks bought that, brought that law. It was a cookie cutter, Alec Bill and it's straight that other states were doing they and it said if they if they're poor performing after three years then we will close them down they have yet to close them down they had a bill to extend their contract again this year and i'm not sure where that is i'm sure it will pass but again that is doing great harm to those students and we continue to give millions to that bad program there's a teacher uh hurt i think his name is hurt he's new as well and he said, well, you know, I'm just concerned about these kids. We're, we need to try something so, you know, we can try vouchers. <laughs> There's no proof that vouchers work. Why would we tr try a program that does not work? And um, we know that community schools work. We know their smaller class size works. Let's try ideas that work. Just because you're frustrated with what's happening now, teachers are frustrated too but we're working to make it better, and we know those dollars not going to public schools are not going to help. Right. So let's see, there's something else here. Does anyone know if Knox County private schools have agreed to take vouchers? Um, and the last voucher bill, I know Webb was not going to take vouchers. Um, this voucher is different. The other voucher said it was only for like $6,300, and they couldn't charge you any more. 
with this voucher is $7,500, but you have to pay the rest of the tuition. So I can't imagine Webb allowing vouchers when their tuition is more than double that. So um, I'm, I'm guessing there will be a lot of schools that won't take vouchers. What we're seeing in other states is these little schools that pop up because there's a $7,500 voucher and they pop up out of nowhere and they take exactly $7,500. It's a miracle. And yeah, it's, it's a, it's a, a little money-making deal and, and that's what we've seen across the country and that's what we absolutely don't want to see in Tennessee. They don't have to teach real science, you no, know? No, no. Not, Not only that, no but certified the, teachers. But then, you know, they oftentimes don't even make it a year and then what right. happens? Well, yeah, when the school closes, where do those kids go? And, you know, you can take your voucher, go pay your private school tuition. The private school can kick you out. Guess where you're going to go? You're going to go back to that public school, but your dollars are already gone. It's just, you know, this is not a good way to make sure. That, you know, you, you mentioned pastors for children, and I know talking to Reverend, uh, he's a Baptist minister, uh, Charles Johnson. Charles, Charles Johnson. And he's t he talks about the community good. You know, that is why we have a commitment to every child in the community, not just a few who can afford to use the voucher. We've got a commitment to every child. And you have schools in Norway where the kids are doing great. And you can walk in any school regardless of the community. And every school is equipped the same. And every school is in good shape. And that's what we don't have here, and that's what we're needing. We don't need to resegregate our communities and take people out of their neighborhoods. We need to fix every school in every neighborhood. And, and fight back against that whole narrative of failing schools. I've never believed there is such a thing. I believe yeah. there are schools that, that need more resources, and uh, we can help... Uh, collect those resources, gather those resources, reach out, building uh, bridges with the community, uh, community schools, all those things that help provide support. The community believes in public schools. Uh, we, we, we give more than what uh, is put in. We have a good product, If uh, what a horrible thing to call a child's education, but we do work hard to, uh, to, to give these kids a chance to succeed. And it's, uh, it's frustrating to realize there's so many people who are behind this push to make it seem like uh, this is the, the year for vouchers. Right, maybe, you know, more than 90% go to public schools. I went to public schools. I, I think I'm doing okay. <laughs> you know, and I went to a public schools at a time where there were a lot more dropouts and a lot fewer graduating and all of those things. So, you know, public schools are doing a great job and the, the problem is we've got struggling families, struggling communities. Again, I have to say, if we raise the wage, if we make sure everyone has access to health care, and we fully fund our public schools, that's when we can lift up every kid in this state, in this county, in this country. Um, Carrie was asking, I confused her a little bit when I was talking about the $7,500. So Carrie... Uh, the previous voucher bill, the previous voucher bill in past years said the school could only take that amount of money. They couldn't ask for more than that. This particular bill, they have to pay the re you do have to pay the rest of the tuition. So if your school costs twenty thousand dollars, you get seventy five hundred, but you've got to come up with the rest of that. And so this is a perfect example of what we're seeing in all the other states. More than 60% of the kids using these vouchers never attended public school. It's just kids who are already in private school getting help with their tuition. So it's really a boom for the wealthy or those of upper middle class, middle class who are able to send their kids to private schools. This pads their budget. This is not helping poor, struggling kids attend private school because they can't pay the extra amount that it costs. Well, it's a nice narrative, but, but these legislators are, are disingenuous if they want us to believe that they really think that's what's going to happen. This is not going to send poor kids to private schools.
It's not enough. Right. So, so here is the big message, and Julie's asking, what do we do next? So next week, the bill is up in Senate Finance, and it's up on the House floor. So what you need to do is call every member, call or email or both, every member of the Senate Finance Committee to tell them to vote no on vouchers, especially if they are your senator. Um, and I will tell you that when you make a phone call, if with teachers, sometimes it's hard to call before 5 o'clock or before 4.30 right. when everybody leaves. So what you can do, if you call and leave a voicemail, the tape of that voicemail goes straight to their email. So if you have to make your calls after hours, that's fine because that's going to go straight to their to their email. But And then every House member will be voting on this bill on t Tuesday or Wednesday. Sorry, I don't have that with me. But this week. So what I would say to you is put a call in to your state representative. And if, like I have a friend, Bailey, she teaches, she lives in Anderson County and teaches in Rome. Call the Anderson County rep. Call the Rome County reps. You know, anybody that you have, you, you know, that you have an interest in. And actually call as many of you as you can. I would call some of those folks who are former teachers like Hurt and Haston and say, how are you doing this to public education? I really would call as many of them as you can. There's a tool on my page from TEA that allows you to, tells you how to contact um, representatives. It also, if you have the time, you can use Hustle, a text program, to text other people to call their reps. So if you have the time commitment or a little bit of time and could help text other people to, to contact their rep, that's a great thing to do too. But also, make a call to the governor's office. He needs to hear how few people really support this plan. And they do log those calls, and they're supposed to record whether people were in favor or against legislation, right? Yeah. So. And, and don't leave people out. I have, I have a new assistant, and she used to be assistant to a Republican representative who is in leadership. And so I'm like, you know, she, I heard her on the phone talking to somebody about how much email I get. And I was, I was like, I, was, I would assume I get less email than a lot of those the people leadership in leadership. People. And she's like, oh, no, no. She said, you get a ton more mail. And so some of these people aren't getting the email. So flood their emails, man. Let them know how you feel. Uh, this Monday, uh, various local uh, affiliates of TEA are... Uh, meeting gathering uh, locally in Knoxville here at the KCEA office on Magnolia at four o'clock. Uh, we're gathering to to protest this, to meet up, to hear some speakers, and we're asking teachers across the state to wear black on Monday. Normally we're red for Ed, but uh, this feels like we're going to a funeral for public education, so we're wearing black on Monday, and um, you know it's uh, it's a time where we have to make our voices very, very focused. Um, if teachers can go to Nashville, parents can go to Nashville. Please um, show up if you can. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's. I, I really wish uh, superintendents across the state would would uh, give us permi permission to do that. You know, I mean, we have an in-service day go. on Monday, and I know there are some teachers who are trying to decide if they're going to go to Nashville Monday instead of in-service. I think I think if teach teachers converged on Nashville on Monday, it would send a huge message. I didn't realize it was an in-service day, yeah. but man, they should do it. Uh, you know, I would hope that superintendents would let them, that, I can't imagine a better thing for your school as an in-service to do than to go and show up in Nashville and make sure your voices are heard. We've been trying to lift up voices for, you know, for weeks now in Nashville, at home, um, and it's just really, it's tough because teachers are so busy. I hear all the time at the legislature, people say, oh, well, you know, legislators talk like they're so busy, and I'm just sitting there going, you guys are not, it's not as busy as a teacher. Right. I, I'm sorry. You know, if this is busy to you, okay, yeah, we're busy, but I'm not nearly as busy as I was as a teacher, and and that's a fact. Absolutely, it is. So, uh, there are things that you can do um, with those phone calls and emails. Uh, wearing black Monday helps. Wearing black and going to Nashville would help even more. 
And so thanks so much for tuning in. If you have questions, continue to write them on there. I'll respond to them. But we just want to get that out, this out there. We want people to really understand about the voucher. And please, stand up, fight back, make your voice heard. Call, go to Nashville, uh, send an email, whatever you can do, whatever your time commitment can be. Please get out there and make your voice heard because this is going to do serious damage to uh, public education in Tennessee. Just Students, we love you. Uh, we're fighting for you. And uh, there's still uh, a lot of fighting to be done. And, and the kids know we're fighting for them. And then the kids in some instances are fighting with us. And I've that's seen really pictures, cool. I've seen pictures of uh, teachers doing their walk-ins uh, before school, holding up uh, signs and seeking support for public schools. Uh, a lot of great signs as the Red for Ed movement as it continues to grow across the state. Uh, we also were seeing a lot of kids in those pictures, too, who are holding up great signs. So, yeah, yeah. Kid, know, kids they, are they, committed. They, they love their public school. Of course they do. It's the uh, center of their life. Yeah. You don't, you know, you rarely hear kids talking about their favorite politician, but they can always tell you who their favorite <laughs> teacher is. I don't think they know a favorite lobbyist. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I, I don't have one. I don't have a favorite lobbyist. <laughs> well, actually, that's not true. I do, but they're like from, um, you know, Appalachian Voices or something like that. So, um, but thank you guys for tuning in. Please do what you can. Get in touch with us. We will help you. Uh, Dave Gorman, he's on Facebook as well. Or the Speak page, S-P-E-A-K, All Education Issues, mostly Knox County, but we talk about everything and there's folks from all over on there. We want to get you the information. I'll get that information we talked about up as soon as I possibly can. Love you guys. Let's fight this and beat vouchers. Thanks so much. Now I have to get up and turn off the tape.